thank you for coming on this rainy day. Um, it's nice to see a crowd that's interested in this topic um, on a day that makes it more difficult to leave from the comfort of our, our, of our warmth and to uh, attend this lecture. Uh, having said that, this is more of a discussion. You know, it's oriented as a, as a discussion for us to come together and begin thinking through the conceptual history of democracy and the way in which it's been used towards various ends uh, since, the, since its inception in the modern uh, nation state. But before we begin, I want us to think a little bit about what democracy is to begin with. Uh, because the term is an enormous one, and it has all sorts of connotations uh, when it comes to political, social, historical, and economic practices. So the question I want to open up with is what is democracy? Uh, and I want to get your senses of, of the multiplicity of this word. Maybe we'll give a minute for everyone to settle in first. And I've been particularly interested in thinking historically through these different notions uh, and to try to expand the way in which we look at them in order to find more emancipatory possibilities. Because the world we live in today is so often dictated by concepts that we receive. Uh, and so our default conceptualization of the world is determined by a, a host of institutional, political, and economic agendas that oftentimes leaves little room for individual creativity, for individual questioning. And I think this is a particularly modern phenomenon. Uh, there's a, there was a time in history when individuals had greater freedom to question and to rethink the concepts that are given to them. And there was a greater role for philosophy to partake in everyday life. Uh, but what modernity has done, particularly around the nation state, has been to institutionalize everything from politics to economics to individual thought itself. So now if you want to question, if you have a critical or a creative relationship to an idea, you end up you know, entering the academy. And you go through a host of institutional paths that are oftentimes very restrictive, uh, and which oftentimes dictate what kinds of questions we ask, what sorts of answers are possible. Uh, and there's a host of political economic relationship basically dictating uh, how we think these days. Now that's a separate topic uh, that we can discuss later, but it's sort of the reason for uh, my coming back to Amman in this past year uh, and uh, co-founding a center called the Institute for Critical Thought, which is an independent uh, institution dedicated towards philosophy and critical theory. Uh, so it's not affiliated with any governmental organization or any corporation, uh, but rather entirely independent, and it wants to nurture a space for academic inquiry in ways that are otherwise um, uh, not possible. And I'm happy to see that several members of the Institute are here today, and I hope that you'll, uh, you'll encourage us to continue the conversations that we've been having in class um, here. Uh, so again, thank you all for coming. Uh, before, before we truly begin, uh, I wanted to get a sense of uh, how you relate to the term democracy. How is it that we fashion and conceptualize this term in everyday life? Uh, so I'm curious what you have to say. And you know, your answers can be as radically different from each other as you are as human beings. So some of you might have you know, a, a, a liberatory notion of democracy. Others might be more cautious about how it's being used today. So who would like to begin? What is democracy? Yes? Um, I think it's a very, very complicated thing, as you kind of pointed out. So trying to go on about the whole list of the right. democracy. I would say that the kind of dominant narrative is around a very sort of narrow procedural 
um, sort of electoral kind of democracy where people can soon elect a new leader within three to five years. Okay, so this is a, a, a contemporary notion of democracy in which representatives are elected uh, to serve a certain number of years, whether that's through a parliamentary system or through a presidential system. Other definitions? Yes? Yeah, I'd like to go back to the linguistic yes. uh, derivation. And uh, from the days of uh, the Hegel's Corpus and the Roman Catholic. Before that time, these days, uh, uh, the domination was to the to the, to the theology. Sorry? To the, to the religious to okay. the church. Um, the, the, the social and you know, political and the, the rule was by the church. Yes. The term democracy actually started there when the notion of taking the right from the church to the people, the, the people. Demo means people. Democracy means rule. Mm -hmm. The rule of the man. The rule of man. Now that's how it started, I think. Uh, as, as. Then the great uh, uh, the, the rule of the rule of the language <coughs> development. The rule of the, that democracy, even the rights of the land. That's mm -hmm. how it was. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the Middle uh, uh, East Europe. Mm -hmm. okay? <coughs> now, the, the development of the democracy actually flowed fully when the Great War, the First War, ended and the old empires were defeated. Then, democratic ideas emerged. Uh, by the French Revolution, by the American <coughs> Revolution, by the, the German unification, and so on. Mm -hmm. There was great uh, flourishing. That was after a great process of, of enlightenment mm -hmm. in Europe. So democracy, as we know it today, was a proof of that, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Now, with the explosion with the, of the people on Earth, now there were problems. There were problems after the Second War, Second World War, due to the, uh, we call the population explosion. The population explosion brought about great hazards to the world because there were fear among people. Uh, democracy was the right of the land, now the, land, the right of the masses. Now, there was a shift now of the As you mentioned, finally we, we, we think of it as a, as a process of uh, electing a uh, president. Right. As we know in Egypt from yesterday, nobody went because right. it's not in their mind. Yes. There was nothing in that in the emptiness there, that there is a complete empty in the mind of an Egyptian. Right. So they don't know what democracy is, they did not experience it, they did not read about it, and so on. So this is okay. my Thank you. Yeah. That's very useful. So here we have tracing, tracing the genealogy of democracy back to the French Revolution, where its modern iteration began. And, uh, and uh, in some ways you've offered us a history of this modern phenomenon of democracy up until today, alongside issues such as population growth, such as the control of, of, of various populations. And now we have, uh, as you mentioned at the end of your uh, genealogy, uh, a discontentment with the democratic process in places like Egypt, where it's been overtaken by uh, an individual uh, with an autocratic rule. Okay, other, other definitions. Could we go back even before the French? Yes. Uh, the ra I, think that, I think that democracy is the radical partaking of citizens in, uh, in any given state in, uh, in the act of politics. It so is, rather, right. But it is absolutely an assertion of individual partaking in politics. I see. And so here we have this kind of um, 
idealized, radical definition for democracy, where the people are ruling not necessarily through a representative regime, but right through direct access. Yeah, because so represent because representation in itself can be very problematic, yes. and it's a question rather than an actual. Right. Yeah. Right. So here we're beginning to see a spectrum. Right. On the one hand, there's representative democracy in which the individual isn't necessarily directly engaged with political decisions, but rather has a proxy, right? And this proxy will never totally align with the number of people who voted for him or her. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the idea of a radical democratic process, where each person has the ability to influence the, the decision-making process. So here we're beginning to think about the, the, the differences on the, on the spectrum. Uh, but what if we go back even further before the French Revolution? Back to the Greek polis. So in, in the Greek polis, the idea of democracy was premised on the notion of free man. And this notion was, that, was, was the idea that there were a collection of Greek men who no longer were dependent upon material necessity. So they were disconnected from material necessity and therefore able to participate in free thought and reflecting upon what it means to partake in a community. Now, this initial sense of democracy is what inspires our current and contemporary scholarship on this topic. And the French Revolution oftentimes took recourse to the Greek model of democracy. Now, even from this first stage within the Greek polis, the freedom and democratic practices of these men was premised on the exclusion of women and slaves. So the only way in which democracy worked in, in the Greek polis was when free men were able to give all the tasks of everyday life to those who did not receive freedom. And so the entire history of democracy in its first kernel in the Greek polis was dependent upon an initial moment of excluding both women and slaves who had to cater to the material necessities of the free men. So the founding moment in democratic thinking and in democratic practice was premised upon an exclusion. And that's something we want to continue tracing. Because in some ways, and several of the sentiments you have mentioned align to this, in some ways democracy is appealing as a category. Because in the abstract, what it promotes is individual freedom, and individual participation, and individual empowerment in relationship to the democratic process. The question, however, is who gets to participate in democracy, and who gets excluded? And the question of the internal and external borders of democracy is a really important one. Because democracy is successful insofar as it only measures its success in relation to the internal criteria of its citizens. And so the founding moment of democracy is perhaps the most obvious example of this, where we have literal exclusion of who is considered free and who is considered a slave. And one of the things we want to trace this evening is the transformation of this internal-external logic of democracy up until today. And how we cannot really think about the success of democracy without thinking about the failure of democracy outside of its own borders. Because we'll find, as in the past 150 years, is that the promotion of internal freedom is very much directly related to the failures and expenses outside of it. So this is, this is just a, a brief genealogy of the term and how it's been used and misused throughout the past years. But I still want to get a, a greater sense of how you think about democracy. So uh, think about this as I try to figure out how to get the screen back up. So in, in 2003, as, as you all know, uh, George Bush declared war in Iraq, right, on the basis of the spread of democracy. That was the rhetoric that was used in order to legitimize uh, military intervention in Iraq uh, to topple the Saddam regime. Now the question is, the amount of violence that went into the occupation, that went into the war, how does it fit with the aspirations of the democratic appeal that George Bush took? How is it possible that a democratically elected leader can justify the killing of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, in order to spread something like security, or something like happiness, something like justice, something like democracy? So what is the logic that allows us to justify and legitimize 
this form of violence within the logic of democracy? Now, this is a central question, which remains a central question in relation to how democratic practices are legitimized uh, internationally. And what I want to suggest is that it's very easy for us to point to the hypocrisies of democracy. Much has been written uh, throughout the past you know, 15 years about the hypocrisy of the Bush regime, about the, about the hypocrisy of American you know, imperialistic intervention all around the world. But that's not necessarily what we're interested in, because these questions can be easily formulated, right? How is it that we can critique Western imperialism? What are the political and economic agendas that favor intervention, right? What sorts of benefits does George Bush and his administration receive economically from the oil uh, programs in, in Iraq? So there are all sorts of incentives, right? Political economic incentives, which democracy is used to justify or used to legitimize in the public sphere. Now, all of this is something we can agree on. This, these are not controversial issues, right? To think about how American imperialism justifies itself in relation to the notion of democracy. But what I want to try to get at is something a little bit more fundamental. What is it about democracy itself, not its hypocritic use? What is it about democracy itself that is problematic? And in some senses, I want to turn to a certain moment in European history where notions of rationality were used to support and legitimize the appeal for democracy. So the image I want to show you is, is a painting from the 1600s. And it's a painting that some of you may know. So does anyone, does anyone recognize this painting? Yes? Well, I, I recognize it from class. I yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating. No, no, please. What do you... So what, what is it called? Let's start with the name. It's Rembrandt, right? It's Rembrandt, so it's, uh, it's the Rembrandt. The Anatomy Lesson? Yes. Right, the Anatomy Lesson from Rembrandt. Right, yes. Oh, thank you, that's useful. So, <laughs> Um, Rembrandt was a Dutch painter who achieved a lot of fame in the 16th and 17th centuries in Western Europe. And in some senses, um, his work allows us to think about the complexities of rationality and democracy as they're articulated today. Uh, so we want to try to think about this painting from a variety of different perspectives. At first, we want to try to analyze what it's doing thematically. And we want to try to build a picture of, of how, at a certain moment in European history, there was a shift in consciousness, there was a shift in people's attitudes towards each other, towards knowledge, and towards truth. And in some sense, Rembrandt's painting represents that pivotal moment in European history. So you want to think about what's happening here, which we can later connect to that image of Baghdad, which we just saw, of, of literal fire, of literal violence. So initially, what do you see in this painting? Feel free to do this. Um, you see a, uh, a couple of students uh, in an anatomy lesson, and there's the teacher, uh, the professor who is yes. doing an anatomy. And uh, just one, uh, I think that, that that is the pivotal, uh, the pivotal mm -hmm. moment is the shift from the human being as an, as an ideal mm -hmm. platonic creature mm -hmm. to the human being as a body as a body in a space, the space of, of, uh, of the city or the, or the state. Interesting, okay. Yeah. From, from the platonic conception to the physical concrete conception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From, okay. from the human being being the ideal creature of God okay. to the human being as a bare body that is being you know, right. cut down on earth. Interesting. So I, I would agree with you insofar as this is a regular anatomy. Yeah. Right? Insofar as they're dissecting a regular body. But I want us to think about what's happening in the scene, which is a little bit abnormal. And before I get into it, I'll just give you a little bit of, of historical background. So public anatomies were part of the elite culture um, of, of the century. So if the if a criminal, or if, sorry, did you want to add something? I just want to say that it looks like a group of um, aristocratic elites of society. Yes. A group of, uh, a group of, um, Looks like um, aristocratic yes. uh, elites uh, exploiting the body of a, of a, of a person from a, a common uh, man. Yes. 
uh, under the name of knowledge, right? Yes. Uh, to justify this uh, under the under the notions of reason and um, uh, science and so on. Yes. So, right. Do you think some sort of justification to what they're doing, although they are what they're doing is is um, inhumane and uh, uh, is a form of uh, um, exploitation. Imposing uh, their views on, on the okay. On so you're introducing the idea of exploitation. You have wealthier elites, right? And we can tell that from their clothing, from how they're presenting themselves. And we have the body of somebody who doesn't resemble them, right? Somebody who's other. Uh, and, and to complete the historical picture, these, anatom these anatomy lessons were basically given every time there was a thief or a criminal who had to be punished by the juridical system. And what would happen is the thief would be somebody from the lower classes, right? Somebody who wasn't a nobleman, somebody who wasn't, uh, you know, part of the upper classes. And because his body is more disposable than the bodies of the elites, his body was then dissected in public, and people would pay certain amounts of money to witness the dissection process, to witness the anatomy lesson. And more often than not, those who were close to the stage, these were public phenomena. So it would be a stage in which this platform was elevated, and you would have the surgeon, the head surgeon, basically teach the new surgeons how to read the body, how to understand its organs, how to create the kind of knowledge based off of the anatomy lesson. And people weren't worried about questions of exploitation, because the idea of human beings was stratified. You had the elites, and then you had the common people. And he wasn't just a common man, he was a criminal. So his body deserves to be exploited for the sake of knowledge. That was the logic that, that was in operation. Now there are several curious moments in which this painting challenges a traditional anatomy lesson. First of all, anatomy lessons, and this one in particular, which Rembrandt likely attended in, in around 1601, was held in the morning at 11 a.m. So it's curious that Rembrandt chose to represent the background in black. Right? There's, there's a strange way in which there's a contrast of light and dark. And what we presume would be light in the background is all of a sudden portrayed in this dark, ghastly black color. So the question that suggests itself is, why is this painting lighted in the way that it is? Where are the moments of intense lighting? Where is our gaze supposed to be directed in this painting? Yes? <laughs> um, the faces. Um, there's also a gradient, like some cases get more light and some don't, um, so yeah, I, I think that's similar. Okay, so we have the idea of the faces are, are lit up. Yeah. What else is lit up here? The body. The body is the corpse. The body, right? The corpse itself. So we have the body and their faces are, are, are lighting up. Now what's curious about that? What's curious about the fact that their faces are alight? So presumably we think of light as that which draws us into the image that which structures our understanding of the image. So insofar as Rembrandt is inviting us to look at the faces of these men, what is it that we see in their faces? Where are they looking if we are looking at them? Yes? So um, if you look at the right lower corner of the picture, you'll see a big book there. It seems like an anatomy book. And um, these guys, instead of looking at the body, they are looking at the book. So. Um, yeah, Robert wants us to to notice that. Yes. And do you want me to continue? Like no, it's okay. I was, was wondering what you guys think. I mean, why is it why is it that they're looking at the book? Right. This is the first question. Why is it that they're looking at the book and not at the body? The construction of knowledge and the yes. institutionalization in paper. Uh, <laughs> um, because knowledge is uh, it's written down, it's yes. ritualized into a book uh, to preserve it, but also to uh, discipline it, to, uh, to make sure that all the generations and other people have the same kind of knowledge, uh, very detailed as yes. the hand of the master surgeon tells us, very yes. detailed kind of knowledge uh, about surgical procedures. Yes, excellent. So the idea that knowledge was recorded and truth was standardized, right? So there is an anatomy lesson, there is, a, there is a textbook that all of the members of this lesson are taking as a reference point. 
Now, why is it interesting that they're looking at the book and not looking at the body? What is it that we assume happens in an anatomy lesson, right? What is the privileged way in which we receive knowledge if we're dissecting something? Sorry? To look straight at the body. To look straight at the body. Where, where are you? Okay, thank you. <laughs> to look straight at the body, exactly. Yes, and no one is looking at the body. It's like, it's not important. Right. Even right. if they, I think even if they saw something in the body, they would believe the whole thing. Excellent. Okay, so in some senses, the way in which the body has been conceptualized, right, and rendered a piece of knowledge, becomes more important than the body itself. And so this is a pivotal moment in the first sense, because the way in which the body has been written down, okay, takes more importance than the body itself. Now, what does that suggest about the body? It's invisible. It's invisible. But what else? So it's, it's clearly there, right? Rembrandt tells us the body is there. But what is the effect of the book taking precedence over the body onto the body, onto the particularity of this, of this body? Yes? The, the individual is secondary to the knowledge that comes yes. from the broad, broad knowledge. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the body is secondary as a source of knowledge compared right? Does the body become substitutable? Yes? You started out saying that this is the God's word. Maybe they are expecting to find something different from the book. Okay. Maybe they are expecting to see something different. Right, right. Yes, and absolutely. There were certain notions that, and, and this dated back to you know pre-Socratic times, where different kinds of people have different kinds of organizational structure, and there was a lot of superstition surrounding how bodies were understood. And so, dissecting a body, you know, might lead you, or dissecting the body of a criminal might lead you to find some new substance, right, which the criminal you know, inherently has, and which nobody else has. So, so there, there is a strain of superstition. But if they're really interested in figuring out what's different about this particular body, then why are they not comparing the body with the book? Why is every single one of their attentions on the book itself, right? This is, this is the perplexing moment. And to ground that in the philosophical debates at that time, there were two schools of thought within philosophy at this point in Western Europe. There were those who believed in what we call empiricism, where the world around us, in its particularity, in its singularity, can give us an idea of the world, where we take our knowledge from the particular moments, the particular elements that constitute our lives. So this is, this is one strand of philosophy at that time. Another strand of philosophy is what we call rationalism, where everything we see can be rationally apprehended, understood, categorized, and written down. And there were enormous debates in Europe about these two different strands of philosophy. And in some sense, the idea that the book takes over the body is a win for rationalism, right? It's a win for rationalizing what the body is and recording this rational endpoint in a book. So that no matter which body you look at, you're always going to be looking for the same kinds of things. Now, if we assume that this is what is in fact happening in this painting, right? If we assume that it's in fact rationality, winning over empiricism. If it no longer matters what this body is, if it only matters what the book tells us to look for, what are we missing out on, theoretically? Now that's one question. The, the other question, which is direct, the, directed, direct, directed to this painting in a very specific sense is, what is it about this body which doesn't fit the scheme offered by the anatomist? So is there something peculiar about this body which doesn't fit the traditional rational notion of what it means to be a human being, as that might be recorded in this anatomy textbook? Does anyone see something strange about this? And, and to ask this question in a slightly different way, if the book takes precedence over the body, then is Rembrandt making some kind of statement to us through the painting? about what rationality misses out on, right? What does rationality miss out on, according to Rembrandt, in this painting? Is there a clue that we haven't yet talked about within the painting that challenges the logic of rationalization which this book imposes? 
Does anyone see something strange about this body? Yes? Um, probably that rationality in the classical sense misses out on the individuality of bodies, of each separate body, the, the bodiness of the body, in other words. Absolutely. So I agree with you theoretically, right? This is what this painting does theoretically. By having all their attention focused on the book, it undermines the particularity of this individual body, right? It undermines the flesh. And we get many clues to this, right? Not only are each of them looking at the book and not at the body, the prime <coughs> surgeon, right, the leader of this anatomy lesson, he's looking off into space, right? He's memorized the textbook. He, he no longer needs to refer to the textbook in order to complete his anatomy. Not only that, he no longer needs to look at the body. So Rembrandt has captured him in a moment of rational arrogance, right? He's looking off into the distance as if it no longer matters what the body is. It only matters what he already has in his mind. So his far off gaze, right? The arrogance of the doctor as he refuses to look at the body, even as he touches it, suggests that he's already internalized what they're still learning, right? He's taken into his consciousness the idea that knowledge comes from a rational, standardized understanding of the world. So I agree with you theoretically, but what is it about this particular body? What is happening in this particular body that the doctors haven't yet taken into account? Yes? Maybe the fact that they covered him, although, I mean, he's dead and they're... So, yeah. Um... Uh, they have this book that explains everything basically and still they covered part of the body although they're actually he's dead and they have no respect for him and they're just cutting his parts right so yeah they have this opportunity towards him even though they're so you're saying it's strange that they still cover him right even though he's dead yeah i agree although it might just be uh, like a certain notion of public decency at that time to keep certain parts of the body covered because remember that there's usually an audience around. And so the idea of maintaining public decency was still important at this time in European history. So even though they don't really respect the body, perhaps they respect the bourgeois attendants who are really interested in remaining you know, decent within the public sphere so that they're not looking at something that you know, would trouble their bourgeois sensibilities. As to the question of him being dead, I wonder, I wonder you know, whether he is in fact dead. I wonder whether his chest is in the process of taking a breath. So there's also the question of exploiting a body that's still alive. But that's also usual practice. There's something about this painting which... Yes? Uh, the man in the middle, in the center of the... Uh, this one? He's, he's, yeah, he's writing now, uh, writing now notes. Okay. I wonder why if there's a textbook that yes. uh, has everything. Interesting. So okay. it might, be, it might have a clue or something. Yeah, so why is, why is he writing things down? Is he writing things down or is he reading, right? Maybe he's comparing notes. And is he looking at the body? No, right? Nor is he looking at the book. Is he looking at us? Right, is he looking? So if he's looking at us, what is he asking us to do? Right? What, is, what, is the, what is the request in his eyes? Now that's a question, but we still haven't figured out what is strange about this body? Any engineers in the room? It's usually the engineer who figures this out. This is a huge stereotype. I'm kidding. You. It's <laughs> yes. They knew that the proportions are off. The proportions, okay. The yes. proportions of what? The the arms are like so it's perhaps this is not a normal body. Okay. I don't know if that's just my perception or if there's actual Okay, so it seems like the, the arms are disproportionate, right? I, yes. <coughs> but proportional mistakes have happened all the time in the pages okay. of that era. So. Okay, so maybe we can, we, we can blame the era, we can blame Rembrandt, maybe he had a mistake. But what if, what if we assume, what if we assume proportionality? And uh, just give me a second to return the image. What if we assume proportionality? What assumptions are we making in figuring out that the body is in fact disproportional? We're supposing the existence of an ideal body. Okay. 
Yes. So in some senses, we're, we're imitating what they're doing by, by looking for a particular notion of symmetry in the body, which may not necessarily be the case. I, I agree. But I wonder if there's something else going on. And I think, I think you're onto something with the notion of disproportionality. Yes. OK, and before talking about the body, I want to talk about those scholars who are not yeah. talking to the body. Uh, they are seem to me like robots who programmed in what they taught. Yes. The master often didn't even look to the book because he already know about it. And the others uh, just questioning what they had been taught. Right. But no one examined the fact. Right. Here we have flesh and blood. The human beings, that like the essential core of human beings, of being material from flesh and blood, and the hand is being cut down and experienced without without even looking at it. So, and the body is always like kind of moving, like the flesh is so stick in the bones in the upsides, and the stomach is like a wave which is moving. So we have a, a human who is maybe is physically suffering or maybe just want to express his own existence, yes. but the scholars are just anatomizing him without even looking at him. So it's about humanity, yes. about not seeing the real humans in us, just to, li to listening to our previous thoughts, what we have been told, without examining examine the real existence of a human being. Absolutely, absolutely. The idea that rationality, recording something in a book, and depending on that for knowledge, whether as a student or as a professor, right, who's, who has memorized the book that he no longer needs to look at it. And what this does, as you mentioned, is basically rule out the humanity of the body, right? So the question I want to pose, which is a question that will take us throughout this, this evening, is at what expense is rationality governing our world, right? If we think of our world as a rational world, if we think about the way in which we organize society as a rational way, if we think of democracy as a rational response to the exploits of the church, or the exploits of a religion, or the exploits of a dictator, then at what expense are we pursuing rationality? Suffering. Suffering. And here we see right, suffering. We see a lack of attendance towards this body. It's rendered as less. It's rendered as disposable. It's rendered as substitutable. And while this is continuing the conversation, I wonder whether Rembrandt is giving us another clue, a really explicit clue, about his own perspective on this issue. Because if we are Rembrandt sitting at a certain moment in history, we could draw this painting, right? We could reproduce it, and it would be a perfect representation of what in fact took place. But I think that Rembrandt is adding something to this painting, okay? He's adding something that never took place at the anatomy lesson. What is it that he's adding? What message does he want to send to us that's hidden in this painting? And take the idea of disproportionality as a clue. Anyone? Yes. <clears throat> Maybe the proportion of the like the triangle the, the, the bare corpse okay. being okay. Maybe I don't know. So it's so, <coughs> supposed to be a thief. Right. So maybe he's uh, like under under human. Yes. So yes. he his humanity is not even respected as a dead body. Yes. While uh, the, the doctors are just about the society, about the uh, right. about considerations. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. He's not respected as a body, right? Knowledge is more important than this body. But I wonder if there's if there's still something else. Yes. Maybe the fact that we are focusing on the hand, mm -hmm. not on the on the heart, for example, or the chest. Yes. It's yes. Strange. It is strange. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and a, a, a note on the historical issue: anatomies never, you know, they usually don't begin with the arms. Right? It's very strange that you know they begin this anatomy lesson with the arm. So and, and the arm is connected to the question of proportionality as well. So is what is it about the arm? Is he a thief? He's a thief. 
Is this related to that? It, it could be, it could be. But I want us to think visually about what's happening. Pretend that you have no cultural background on this image. What is strange about that hand? Yes? It seems to be quite long. Okay. Uh, like if you can compare the legs size to the arm size, yeah. they're almost the same length. And chest is almost the same length as the legs as well. So okay. it seems to be only proportioned. Yes. Yeah, so again, this idea of disproportionality of oh, this body. Yes. Okay, uh, about the hand. Uh, first, I want I will notice that second hand, the other one, which has not been exported yet. Yes. It's very close to the person. Yes. And it's like, it seems to be his own hand. Yes. While the other hand is closer to the scholars or the professor. Uh, and it's like, it represents a tool of uh, production. And which, uh, this democratic system is yes. trying to fix this tool of production yes. on their own benefit. Right. Without giving uh, any interest of the body, yes. and they start like uh, cutting the hand from the nearest uh, place of the heart, actually. Yes. Yeah, they, they are need to to shape human beings in a way in which their ideology taught them to do so. Yes. So, so yes. yes. I agree. I agree, and I think I think we're really teasing out the, the complexities of this image. We're teasing out the complexities of what Rembrandt wants us to see. But I still think <laughs> there's one there's one thing. There is the above and then we'll go. The the hand itself seems to be a bit empty if you look at it like that. So it seems to be just empty from inside. There's no stop flash anymore. Yeah, there's no flash. It, it's all been it's all been ripped off. Yes, but even the, the wound itself, I mean, it's always the start of this thing, but it also looks empty from, mm -hmm. from far away. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. There are two right hands. Say that again. There are two right hands. What do you guys think? Why do you say that? Because it's the sun. Yes. Yes. And why is that strange? Well, no one has two. Right. <laughs> does, does everybody see this? So this is this is my right hand. This is my right hand. And it would seem like this is my left hand, but in fact it's a twisted right hand. The shape of the thumb, the curl of the thumb, and the curl of the four fingers suggest that the disproportionality of this arm is due to the fact that it's a second right arm. Now, what do we make sense? What, how do we make sense of this? What does this What does this mean? Yes. Maybe you wanted to show them that they're all looking at this book that's explaining the body, but actually. They don't, they don't even notice this, um, uh, this guy who has two right hands, and he wants to show how absurd the situation is. Yes, yes, absolutely. He's not, only, he's not only just analyzing his body, he's literally holding the second right hand, right? He's holding, literally, a miracle, right? He's holding something that doesn't fit within the anatomy lesson, something that completely challenges the basis for the rationalization of the body, which is symmetry. And he's not only just ignoring it, he's looking away as he holds it. So in some sense, this is Rembrandt's slap in the face for all of the doctors and all of the movements within his own time which sought to rationalize the body, standardize it, render it substitutable, without really thinking about the multiplicity and plurality of the ways in which the body can exist.